love to see families sing together. Amen. Amen. I love that. <laughs> That's good. All right, if you have your Bible, turn with me tonight to the book of Revelation, chapter number three. And Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 14. Revelation chapter number 3 and verse 14. In Revelation chapter number 3 and verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in His throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Father, bless this holy book now. In Jesus' name, amen. The second and third chapter of the book of Revelation addressed to the seven churches of Asia Minor. These are churches that existed 2,000 years ago. I was very privileged with one trip to the Holy Land with Brother Bob Bevington, whom I respect and love greatly. And one trip to the Holy Land with Brother Bevington, we went to Turkey. And these churches are located in what's modern day Turkey. And the churches, of course, do not exist except the one. And uh, it's located there in uh, the, the church, I think it's Smyrna, that's located there in, I forget the name of the city, in Turkey. But in any event, these seven churches did exist 2,000 years ago. And these, this letter that was addressed to them here in the book of Revelation is a genuine letter addressed to the problems that uh, they encountered 2,000 years ago. Now, some folks interpret these seven letters to represent the chronology of the church age as it passes from that time until this, and it's pretty good. It makes, it's, there's a good application to that. But tonight I want to call your attention to something here because I do believe with all of my heart that this church of Laodicea is definitely characteristic, verse number 14, of the t church age that we live in now. We live in a time of the church of Laodicea. The word Laodicea simply means the rights of the people. It is the people's rights over God's rights. It's when the people take precedent over the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, and the preaching of the gospel. As I said to you this morning, it is the self-love, hedonistic generation. And you live in that. It's not our choice, but we just happen to be here. So what we do when we live in a generation like this is bear witness to the truth, the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Bible says that we are the salt of the earth and we're the light of the world. The government's not the salt of the earth nor the light of the world. The educational system's not, nor any other system. But the church of God is the pillar and ground of the truth. If the, tr if the truth does not issue forth from the church, there is no truth. Make no mistake about that. So the church of Laodicea is the church of the rights of the people. So what does that mean, preacher? Well, in a practical sense, let me give you an idea of what it means. Here's a man by the name of Chuck Baldwin. How many's ever heard of him? A few of you have, Chuck Baldwin. This man's a pastor, he's pastored many, uh, many years, he said, most of his adult life. And this was posted on the News With Views website. How many's ever been on that website? News With Views. Uh, I don't know, I don't think I have a link on that on my web page, but in any event, uh, I don't endorse everything on any website, but they have a lot of good stuff. News With Views carried this article written by Chuck Baldwin, dated September the 26th, 2013. That makes it three days old. Now, what he says in the article is very instructive, so I want to give it to you tonight because I believe it describes the church of Laodicea to a T. Here's his question he poses at the beginning of the article. Why pastors won't take a stand? 
he answers that question. Do you want to hear what he has to say? I am constantly asked, Chuck, why don't pastors take a stand and speak out? I've been a pastor most of my adult life. I believe I am qualified to answer that question. Here's the stark reality. The vast majority of pastors today are success oriented. And you all agree with that, don't you? Beginning in Bible college or seminary and continuing throughout a pastor's ministerial life, the emphasis is success. And that means church growth, larger congregations, bigger buildings, bigger offerings, burgeoning statistics, greater notoriety, denominational praise, invitations to speak at conferences, applause from fellow ministers, not to mention the financial perks and benefits that come with pastoring a successful church. How many agree with that? That's the reality of it. Pastors don't like to admit that because that gets into the nuts and bolts of what motivates most of them, but it's the truth. And the way to learn how to build a successful church is to learn from those who have done it. Pastors regularly attend church growth conferences to learn from the big churches, past, from the big church pastors on how it's done. They purchase books, magazines, newsletters, etc. They're all geared towards telling pastors how to build a successful church. They're constantly being schooled in the latest and greatest how-to strategies of church growth and success. This usually entails more and more sophisticated programs, music, sound, lighting, atmosphere classes, seminars, organization, etc. Everything I mean, and I mean everything, is geared towards success as described in the aforementioned paragraph. My observation through the few years I've been pastoring, that's right right down the line. The bigger the better. That's the philosophy. That's the message today. But my observation has been that bigger is not better. And you'll always be accused of being envious or jealous when you try to preach like I'm trying to preach to you tonight. But the truth of the matter is it's not about how successful we are. It's about how faithful we are. I'm not interested in building a big church. I'm interested in being faithful to Christ. I'll let him build his church. He said upon this rock, I will build my church. The bottom line, men aren't satisfied with the work of the Holy Spirit and feel like it takes human, human ability, human intellect, human ingenuity, and what have you. Let's build a big ministry for Christ. You won't find that in the Word of God. The Apostle Paul says, I prayed that an effectual door would be open for me. He had an intent to go east. And a man from Macedonia showed up in a vision and said, come over and help us, when sent his, which sent him northwest from where he was. And why the Holy Spirit chose not to carry the gospel into Asia is God's business. But the gospel is going into Asia today. They're being saved by the tens and thousands, yea, hundreds of thousands, even millions in Asia are being born again while the church in America rots. So did he tell the truth about being success oriented? If the church has that kind of mindset, in other words, the people are conscious of that, then they're complicit with it, aren't they not? Are they not? If the church knows that their pastor is a big business pastor and it's all about numbers and it's about church growth and so forth and success so that it can brag and what have you, they're conscious of that and they agree with that, they are complicit. They are just as guilty as he is. But you're going to pay a price if you build a big church. It's going to cost you dearly. You've got to understand that you have to play by certain rules if you're going to do that. And that's the problem. Because our Lord Jesus Christ played by no man's rules. When he came into this world, some of the most scathing messages ever preached by a man were preached by the Son of God. The Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 called them hypocrites. He preached more on hell than anybody that ever lived on this earth. The Lord Jesus Christ did. But you don't hear much about that. The reason you don't is because it doesn't fit the program. The program has been uh, created and, and uh, manufactured by some of the slickest minds on Madison Avenue. The church growth today is an industry. It's an industry. It's an industry. All kinds of things, as I just read to you, are directed toward church growth. Now you notice that there's nothing in there about a soul being born again. There's really nothing in there about glorifying God. There's nothing in there about the, about the will of the Lord. Does he want every church to look alike? No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He doesn't want us all to look alike. Every church has its own unique identity. 
And it ought to be that way. And it's good to have it that way because it shows the unity of the churches to come together to, for when he builds the body of Christ. He takes Italians and he takes Germans. He takes the Swiss. He takes Englishmen. He takes American. He takes Africans. He takes what? Asian, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans. And he builds the church of the living God. The one thing they have in common is the Holy Spirit. Another thing they have in common is the Holy Bible. Another thing they have in common is the Holy Ghost, the Lord Jesus Christ, preached by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. We have that in common. I can be certain with you tonight that if I meet a brother in China, if I meet a brother in Korea, if I meet a brother in Switzerland, that brother's going to preach the same Christ I preach. There may be points of doctrine we don't all agree on, but we're going to preach the same Christ. We're going to preach Jesus and Him crucified. We're going to preach Him as the only way to heaven. That it is by His blood that your sins are washed away. No other way. And if we don't agree on that, that's not my brother. He may be religious, but he's not my brother. And, and, and whether he is an Asian or an African or a European has nothing to do with it. It's the message that comes out of their mouth. And of course, the message that comes out of the mouth is the message of the heart. It's what's confirmed in the heart and in the soul. So, Mr. Baldwin, God bless you. I agree with you. Let's see what else he says. He says most pastors today are in reality nothing more than a corporate CEO. The same mentality, philosophy, strategy that drive corporate uh, boardrooms also drive the boardrooms of modern churches. To a T, pastors act like CEOs, dress like CEOs, talk like CEOs, manage like CEOs, and think like CEOs. <laughs> That's right. What's that CEO? Chief Executive Officer? CEOs. Private jets. They were talking about a portfolio the other day on television. I said to my wife, where's our portfolio? She says, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, we don't have a private jet. I don't want a private jet. I don't need a private jet. For the one that did not have a place to lay his head, and the one who raised that one at the gate called beautiful said, silver and gold have I none. And the apostle Paul who said, and with such as you have, be content. You say, does God want me in poverty? I've never met one yet in poverty. When an American doesn't have all the money he wants in his hand to do everything that he wants to do, he thinks he's in poverty. Folks, the poorest American I've ever met is living far above the standard of the third world. Say, so how do you know? I've been there. I've walked down their streets. The smell hits you when you get off the jet, stays with you until you get back on that jet. I've watched people. I, I won't say in from the pulpit what I've seen. I've been around and I know what poverty is. Now, I know Americans have a rough time. And we have folks here in our church that have had hard times and are going through hard times right now. And it's the responsibility of the church of the living God to come to aid of its brothers. Amen. And I fully believe in that. Amen. But real poverty, I'm sure, there is, I'm sure it exists in America. Sure it does. But it's not like it is in other countries. God takes care of his people. How many of you tonight by being honest would witness and say, yes, the Lord's taken care of me. Amen. He has taken care of me far beyond my wildest dreams. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now he says in another paragraph, dare I say that even the way pastors and churches cater and reach out and minister, etc., has mostly to do with good business. Church members are babied and pacified and stroked and petted and fawned over because it is good business. How many of you like to be petted, uh, pet, uh, petted and, and babied and, and uh, fawned over and uh, made to feel special and, and, uh, you're carnal if you do. You should be thinking about somebody who's going through a hard time. Get on your knees and pray for them. You say, I don't have anything to pray about, preacher. That's because you are insensitive in the spirit to the suffering in this church right now. We have people right now at Temple Baptist Church that are in dire need of prayer. You say, I don't know what to pray about. Come to church on Wednesday night and you'll get a prayer list before you know it. You'll have people that you need to be praying for. And prayer, I'm watching prayer being answered right before my very eyes. I've seen more prayers answered in the last month. God is answering prayer. And if that doesn't encourage you to pray more, I don't know what will. He's answering prayer. I've seen him do it. I see him doing it right now. God answers prayer. You need to start praying again. Not being babied, 
But you see, churches fight for members. People pull people out of our church. The pastor will come up and say to you, we need you at our church. We need you to help us. I mean, you could fit right in in our church. We need you. God would bless you. We need you at such and such a church. I think that's unethical. I've been here 37 years and God's my witness. I have never asked someone to leave a church and come to Temple Baptist Church. Now I've got my problems and I've done my sins, believe me. But I have never, never in 37 years have I ever gone to another man's church, another pastor's church, his ministry, and reach in there and try to pluck one of his members out and bring them over here to Temple Baptist Church and tell them I've got a job for you to do. This is what God wants you to do. I guarantee you what I just said will make people mad at me. That's between them and God. Well, you say, what about if God wants you to go? So God will let you know. If God wants you to go somewhere and work in a church and minister in a church, I have no problem with that. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But I've got a problem when a human agency is involved in it and they come in and start plucking you out and pulling you and so forth. And so we've had a number of people go to a church out here in Halls and this pastor out there at Halls said, you go back and talk to your pastor first and see what he thinks about this and do some praying about this. And that's happened more than once in the last few years. And do you know what that has done for me? That has built respect in me for that man. I respect that man for that attitude. I may not agree with him on all the points of doctrine, but I respect him for that attitude because that's the right attitude. Do you understand what it is when people get plucked up from a congregation of people? They get pulled out like you root somebody up? It's one thing if you know the hand of God's on you and you know that God's given a gift and a spirit and a ministry to someone and God leads them into such a place to minister. That's fine. That's one thing. But for somebody to just reach in and pluck somebody up, folks, you're a congregation. You are an organic body. You're a bunch of believers that bear one another's burdens. The church is a unity of believers. That's the way it ought to be. And when something like that happens, it causes all kinds of trouble. So we don't go down the street and try to proselyte and drag people off from another church. We don't do that. I haven't done that. And God's been good to us. And we've made it just fine. We've never fought over members. I remember years ago they talked about how that the bus ministries, they'd go out with a bus and they'd go out up, up and down the streets and visit, you know. Well, I'm not here to criticize a bus ministry. But I was told that one bus would come through and offer them this and another bus would come through behind and offer them something more and bigger to get them off of one bus on the other bus. You say, why would they do that? Because they've got a quota. They've had a quota put on them. Is that the way God builds His church? No, He doesn't, folks. There's nothing wrong with a bus ministry. Don't misunderstand me. It's a wonderful thing. Every church doesn't have a bus ministry. Those that do have a bus ministry, God bless them. But I'm trying to show you how that human beings and their pride and their ego get involved in the ministry of Christ. So we'll stick with what we've got. How many of you have ever read over here in the book of Hebrews chapter number 11 verse 34? Would you turn there with me and read this? Hebrews 11 and verse number 34. Quench the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in flight. I added a letter there, didn't I? I wondered how many people followed me here. They didn't fly, they did what? Fight. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. How many of you ever, how many of you ever heard a preacher preach a message about God's people fighting? <laughs> That's what that is. They fought. They were warriors. When they took the Holy Land, they were warriors. But that warrior goes further than that. When they fought off the invading hordes of the Muslims coming into Europe, they fought them. To the, they fought them. They had to fight them. If they had not fought the Muslims coming into Europe, your children would have been born into a Muslim country. And that's exactly what the Muslims are doing right now, folks, all over the East, all over the Middle East. They're driving the Christians out, and they've got another yihad, they call it, holy war, and they're moving west. They've already filled up France. They're parts of Paris, France right now. 
that, that the French people know not to go to. Even the French police won't go into these parts. Just a few days ago in Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya, a shopping mall that was built by the Israelis, a beautiful shopping mall was invaded by murdering Muslims. They plucked out the eyes of the people. They shot young men when they were asleep. They raped the women. The atrocities that they performed down there in Nairobi, Kenya is unbelievable. And one of the women they say that was leading that attack is a Caucasian woman who was married to a Muslim in London, England, who was killed about three or four years ago in a suicide assault. Her husband died. Islam is a religion of death. It's a death cult. And so she became apparently has a bunch of, they're saying that she is a leader in this, uh, in this, in this uh, radical jihad movement in the Muslim world. And they slaughtered, they say, over 70 people down there in Kenya. And they're not sure if the number may grow because they still have to get into a lot of the stuff piled up. They may find more bodies. But they came in there and indiscriminately they took children that were sitting there having a class, a re some kind of a reading class, little children, little children, having some kind of a class, went in there with their guns and their knives and they massacred them. Where they said, I, I wonder what kind of religion that is. Do you want any part with that? Will you let a bunch sitting up there in Washington, D.C. tell you that's a peaceful religion? That's the voice of an ignoramus. I challenge you to go check the historical record, folks. It is not a peaceful religion. But in any event, put to fight, they fought. And sometimes they have to fight. I'm not trying to foment, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, sedition tonight, overthrow the government. But I am telling you that there comes a time sometimes when you have to fight. If somebody came through that back door right there, just two days ago, three days ago, I don't know when it was, just look at Drudge if you want to look at it. Check it out. A pastor was shot to death in his pulpit. He was up preaching. He was, the man came through the back door and shot him to death while he was standing in the pulpit preaching the Word of God. I think it was in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm not sure where it was. But it's just been the last two or three days. He came through the door and shot the man to death. Just a few years ago over here on Kingston Pike, a man came through the door with a shotgun at a church over there on Kingston Pike. And I don't know how many people died in that rampage. They're coming right into the churches today, folks. And they're killing people. What if one came in here and started shooting your children? What would you do? Would you call 911? You would while the bullets were flying, maybe. There comes a time when you defend your people. And that's necessary. And it's a shame it's come to that. Because when I was a boy growing up in America, they left the church doors unlocked. Now they're walking into the churches armed to the teeth and they're, sh and they're killing people. What does that mean, people, preacher? That's the change of the culture. The culture in America has changed from that society into the rotten society that it is today to fight. <laughs> so they are listed as the heroes of faith. Remember that. They are in the list of the heroes of faith. This man that wrote this article says, Tim, a constitutional attorney, Tim, a constitutional attorney that knows this man, and I co-authored a second book that is also relevant to this discussion. It is called, To Keep or Not to Keep, Why Christians Should Not Give Up Their Guns. This book searches the entire Bible conclusively proves that self-defense is not only a God-ordained right, it is a God-ordained duty, and that Christians are totally justified in not surrendering their means of self-defense to any civil authority. Amen. Amen. The average pastor, to the average pastor, nothing is anathema as controversy, and nothing is more controversial than politics. And are we in the midst of a dog fight in Washington over politics? I'm not a Republican anymore, and I'm not a Democrat. I'm a Whig. 
<laughs> I'm neither one. I'm really not. There's some good Republicans, and there's probably some good Democrats here and there. But the truth of the matter is, <laughs> I guess you can tell which way I lean. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, folks, if you sit back and don't go to the polls and vote, then your sitting and your silence is giving approval to what's happening in this country. And what's happening in America, folks, is not pretty. You need to know why you vote and who you vote for. You need to have a reason for going to the polls. And you should be doing some praying about it. And the sad thing is, down through the years, I've got a lot of criticism over the fact that I've made statements about, about the political process. But as American, as a citizen of America, you have a responsibility to do something about the direction of the country that you live in. How many of you people in here served in the military? I gave them four long years. Believe me, they were long years. Four of them. I served in the military. And so that for, therefore I bought, if nothing else, the right to go and vote for who I think is best for office. Amen. Amen. All right, now Matthew chapter number 23, verse 33. Turn there with me, please. Matthew 23, 33. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 33, said, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Yeah. Now, who said that? Some drunk, raving lunatic? No. That's Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's our Savior, that lowly Galilean, our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who went to the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He looked at him eyeball to eyeball and he says, you're nothing but a bunch of vipers. He held his worst criticism for the religious leaders of his day. I know a lot of you don't think about this, but the Bible tells me as a pastor that I watch for your souls. The Bible also says, be not many teachers or instructors, for we shall receive the greater damnation. God holds us very accountable if we get in the pulpit and we get start giving out heresy and, uh, and all the garbage that goes with it. It's a big responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. Uh, I want you to notice something else that he said. Don't forget that most churches are up to their eyeballs in debt. Therefore, pastors are afraid if they offend people, offerings will go down and they might not be able to pay for all those fancy buildings and exorbitant staff. Not to mention their own personal financial perks might be endangered. And yes, I must also add that 5013C, nonprofit tax exempt status, most churches operate under, poses a serious intimidation against the pastor and church, which keeps them from taking a stand or speaking out on issues that might be construed as political. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an entirely separate message in itself. The 5013C simply means that it is a tax exempt organization. Where does that come from? That comes from the Internal Revenue Service. A governmental agency determines whether you are tax exempt or not. So what does that mean? That means if you are tax exempt, the church doesn't have to pay taxes on the money that's put in the plate that's already been paid taxes on when you earned it. It's already been taxed a dozen times before it ever goes to the plate. It's already been taxed to death. You're taxed to death now. So a church that falls under a 5013C must fall under the regulations of the Internal Revenue Service. You remember the crowd up there in Washington, D.C. right now that targeted the Tea Party, conservative people, and the head of the group, one of the groups right now has just resigned. They took her off. She's resigned. She's gone. And one of the things she made statement to before the, before the Congressional Committee is, I haven't done anything wrong. But then when the facts began to come out, and all the facts have not come out, but she says, I've done nothing wrong. Well, if she's done nothing wrong, why did she resign? Why was she forced out? If she's innocent, she has nothing to hide, right? 
If you're innocent, you have nothing to hide. If you're innocent, you have nothing to fear. It's when you've built your life on lies and you're trying to cover something up, that's when you have something to fear. The Internal Revenue Service was born in 1913 on Jekyll Island in Georgia. It was born when some of the leading bankers in the world conspired and came together to create the Federal Reserve. When they created the Federal Reserve, they created a federal income tax to go with it. And, and these two things, the Federal Reserve on one hand and the federal income tax on the other, have become a very stranglehold on the very lives and souls of the American people. People are like me, you, everybody that's alive right now, we were born under that, have known nothing else but that. And with it, this horrible intimidation of the Internal Revenue Service. It is a tyrannical organization. If it wants to destroy you or me, it, ha it, has, it can do it any time it pleases. This is why it's been brought before that committee, and even they worry about what they're doing because they know it has been given powers that even the police don't have. The Internal Revenue Service can become an, a terrorist organization. And why is it like that? Because it wants you to have fear, to fear it so that you will pay your taxes to raise the revenue. And so churches fear. Churches fear. And when churches fear, what does it do to the message? And what does it do to our foundation? What does it do to who we are? The fear of man, the Bible says, bringeth what? A snare. And it'll bring a snare. It always has and it always will. It always has and it always will. So this is why Temple Baptist Church is not head over heels in debt. If you're in debt, you're servant to the lender. That's what the Bible says. You become a servant to the lender when you go in debt. Somebody said, well, our church is doing this, our church is doing that, our church is doing this, our church is doing that. Fine, whatever you're doing. But if Temple Baptist Church was head over heels in debt, let's say we owed $2 million. Let's say this church owed $2 million. That's an awful lot of money that you have to come up with every month to make payments on $2 million. That's a pile of money. Now, when they loan you money, they'll charge you X number of dollars in interest. And you're going to have to pay interest on that money. It would be all this church could do to pay the interest on the bill, much less ever touch the principal. Two million dollars. So what does that mean? That means that you have to have so many people. That means you have to have so much money going into the plate. That means that the offerings have to be maintained at a certain level. That means that that pastor has, goes to bed at night with sweat breaking out on his forehead, hoping that the, that the offerings don't drop so that they can, make, they can meet that payment. Down through the years, we have received letter after letter after letter from churches that are folding up with schools and buildings and all of that saying, if we don't get some money, we're going to have to close our school and we're going to have to cut our staff and we're going to have to do this and do that and do this and do that. Down through the years, folks, I have received many letters of people doing that. I say, what do you do, preacher? I pray for them. But that's a sad situation to get in. That's horrible. So what does it do? It puts you in bondage. And you talk about destroying a congregation of people. You let them come, to, come under that kind of pressure, you can destroy them. What if you had to worry about every soul that came to Temple Baptist Church? If we lost, say you've got a big giver in your church. I remember a church where a man had a big giver in his church. Now, I'm not mentioning any names. This was a long time ago. But he catered to, the, to that big giver. He took him out and dined him, catered to him. This man had money. He catered to him, went out of his way, made a difference between him and the other people. Well, he died not long after that. God won't mess with a preacher when that preacher of all people begins to turn away from his calling and where the money does really come from. The money doesn't come from you folks. It comes from the Lord. And when you've learned to walk with God, you know that the money you have in your pocket to give back to God, He gave to you to begin with. You don't have anything to give that He didn't give to you. So I don't believe in going in debt like that. Don't believe it. I don't believe in it. That's going to put a stranglehold on the church, especially in this age, in 2013. It's not better, it's worse. Because people today uh, don't believe in giving. They haven't learned a simple lesson 
that if you give, God will give back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That if you ever learn to tithe a tenth of your income to the Lord, God will take that 90% and it will go much further than that 100% that you keep. So many people wind up in financial ruin because they, and I'm not going to call it robbing God, that's an Old Testament doctrine, but they have done this. They have refused to sow into the work of God and give to the Lord His portion and His part. If you do not give, then you do not receive. And God will bless you abundantly if you give God what belongs to Him. Now, of course, God's interested in far more than a dollar bill. He's interested in your heart, and your life, and all things that matter to Him. Here's the bottom line. As long as Christians in the pews continue to attend and financially support these stand-for-nothing churches, the churches will continue to languish in their indifference. After all, by the attendance and offerings of all of these people in the pews, pastors are being continually convinced that everything they have been taught is working. Their churches are successful. The only way Christians can start making a difference in their country, that's the good old U.S. of A., the stars and stripes, the history of this nation. I don't know of any nation apart from Israel that was ever founded on more nobler principles than the United States of America. It was noble. The only way Christians can start making a difference in their country is to get out of these clueless, cowardly churches and find a pastor who is not afraid to be politically incorrect who is not afraid to preach and teach biblical principles of liberty, and who is not afraid to preach and teach the principles of righteousness, righteous defiance against an act of tyranny. Find a pastor who's not trying to be successful. You don't need a successful pastor, you need a truthful pastor. By this means that people in the pews must truly want to be in a church that takes a stand. We have the kind of pastors and churches that we are willing to support. If that's the case, Christians should stop complaining about the indifference of their pastors and simply accept the imminent slavery to which they are being led. You get the kind of government you deserve. That's right. And that's why we have the kind of government we've got right now. And I'm telling you again, both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat. I am no Republican cheerleader because there's so much corruption there, it's unbelievable. The poll political mess in America is an abomination. So what do you do? You go to the polls and you say something about it. You do what you can. You stand on your Christian principles. And the heritage that was handed to you was handed to you by people who, had, who were brave and had convictions. And we're living in the prosperity of our grandfathers and great-grandfathers and great-great-grandfathers and grandmothers. The hard work that they put into this nation. That hard work right now is being squandered. The principles that made America what it is right now is being cast aside. The people have lived in luxury, they've lived in affluence, and they don't appreciate one bit the hard work that went in to what we enjoy today. America is America because America at one time was on its knees before God. Not all Americans were Christians, no sir. Not all the founding fathers were believers, no sir. But they did believe in the principles of what the Bible taught. And those principles you are, we are enjoying tonight, but they are quickly, quickly, quickly leaving this nation. And the churches that you were born into, into this Bible Belt and in the other parts of this country where Bible-believing churches are located, that church did not just happen to be. That church is a product of faithful men and women who stood true to the Word of God and handed down to their, their children a heritage that they can thank God for tonight. And I thank God for it. I thank God for a Bible-believing church. I thank God for every one that will accept the truth and stand for the truth and help disseminate the truth and say, this is what I believe, this is where I stand, regardless of who's on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue or either aisle of the Congress and Senate. This is what I believe, this is who I am, this is where I stand. That makes a difference with God. Father, in thy name we pray. I pray you'd use what I've said tonight for the glory of God, Lord. My Heavenly Father, it's been very pointed and instructive. And it may cross some people. 
but that's all right. I told the truth. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name now that you'd bless it and bless those that heard it. And Father, thank you for the article by Chuck Baldwin, this, this pastor, this, this minister, God, who, had, who had, the, uh, had, had the courage and the intelligence to write the kind of article he did, the keen perception that he has. I pray and thank you for that and for his wisdom. Now in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake we ask it. And amen. All right.